Jay Jones arrived at ORNL as a postdoc about 1995 or so. Uh, actually, I think Jay um, invited himself to Oak Ridge, but he brought his own funding, so I just got out of his way. Jay did some really outstanding research on CO2 and methane dynamics in streams and rivers. In a study of CO2 dynamics in Walker Branch published in Ecosystems, Jay showed how streamwater CO2 concentrations could be used with the biogeochemistry model to infer catchment scale soil respiration rates. I think this paper is still somewhat underappreciated by terrestrial biogeochemists. Jay also conducted several survey studies of CO2 and methane concentrations and patterns. In one of these studies, published in Biogeochemistry, Jay showed that CO2 concentrations declined, but methane concentrations increased with increases in stream size throughout the network. This suggested that impor the importance of terrestrial processes for as a, as a dominant source of CO2 in streams but, in, but it also showed the increasing importance of anaerobic processes in riparian and stream systems as sources of methane. And these, uh, and these processes increased with increasing stream size. Well, the first LODIC intersite nitrogen experiment, or LINX, project began about 1997. This project resulted from a proposal to NSF that was initiated a workshop at Coweta back in, I think it was 1996. And Donna Morrell uh, organized this research and you can see a photo of the, of the uh, folks there at the, at the workshop in the upper left. This project used a new field approach six-week continuous additions of N15 ammonium to examine nitrogen cycling and food web, web dynamics in 12 streams across the U.S. Cross-system results were summarized in papers by Bruce Peterson and Jack Webster and showed that in-stream processes could reduce inorganic nitrogen concentrations by two-thirds over a one-kilometer reach of stream. Our results also showed that the strongest predictor of ammonium uptake was dis discharge, but that stream metabolism also influenced uptake length. This project resulted in a number of outstanding papers presenting results at individual sites as well. Well, in addition to the really great collaborative spirit of everyone involved in this project, its success was in large part due to one individual, Jen Tank, who basically lived out of a suitcase for three years, setting up each of the experiments and training site personnel on all the techniques. Amazingly, Jen has not lost her appetite for field work at far-flung places despite this. I was fortunate to get involved with Maury Vallette, Jack Webster, Steve Thomas, and the rest of the Virginia Tech and New Mexico stream teams in a project with the acronym NPARS, which, to be quite honest with you, I still don't know the, the meaning of. In this project, we used 12-hour additions of N15 labeled nitrate at very high isotopic enrichments to study nitrate dynamics and denitrification in Walker Branch and streams at Coweta and New Mexico. Maury recently published a synthesis of this work showing large seasonal and stream-to-stream -stream variations in nitrate uptake rate and the importance of in-stream metabolism driven by energy inputs on uptake rate. 
Well, we had so much fun in the first Lynx project that we decided to put together a proposal for a second Lynx project with many of the same PIs. However, this project was much larger and was focused on stream nitrate dynamics across biomes and land uses. In this study, we used 24-hour N15 nitrate injections to 72 streams encompassing uh, eight different biomes and three land uses in each biome. We published a synthesis of our results showing that although total nitrate uptake increased with increasing nitrate concentration, the efficiency of uptake or the fraction of the available nitrate in water that was removed declined with increasing concentration, resulting in removal of a lower fraction of the, of the nitrate load as you move downstream. A critical part of this paper was a river network analysis uh, conducted by Ashley Helton and Jeff Poole that showed that as nitrate loading increases, the network becomes less efficient in removing nitrate, and the smaller streams in the network become less important in this removal than the larger streams. I also want to highlight an unsung hero on this project, Steve Hamilton, who solved one of our most vexing problems by developing very clever approaches for sampling and analysis of N15 and nitrogen gas, without which we could have never, uh, we would never have been able to measure denitrification rates. Uh, this uh, apparatus that Steve is using in this photo, however, was not what I was referring to. A number of other synthesis papers have come out of the Lynx 2 project, and there, have, uh, and there should be several more still to come. One of these, published in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment, Ashley Helton showed the importance of, it, of including eco-hydrologic models, multiple el elements, and floodplain interactions in river network analyses of nutrient dynamics. Melody Bernau and others published the metabolism results using a structural equation model shown in the upper right. Mel showed that GP, or gross primary production was primarily controlled by light and inorganic nitrogen concentration, whereas ecosystem respiration was controlled mostly by water temperature, nitrogen concentration, and DOC concentration. Stuart Finley showed that denitrification enzyme activity was a good predictor of denitrification rates measuring with the N, measured with the N15 techniques, and that nitrate and DOC concentrations were significant predictors. And Bob Hall did SEM analysis of nitrate uptake and denitrification, showing how each was controlled by strong direct effects of discharge, nitrate concentration, and either GPP in the case of uptake or respiration in the case of denitrification. And this analysis also pointed to strong indirect effects of nitrification, which supplied nitrate to the system. And Jake Bollier have a paper that will be coming out soon in PNAS showing that denitrification in streams only produces a small amount of the greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. Mostly the, the, end, the end product of denitrification was almost exclusively N2 gas. However, using measured emission rates from Lynx 2 streams and a global river network model, Jake showed that streams are an important source of nitrous oxide to the atmosphere, and that's probably due to in-stream nitrification 
or input from groundwater, uh, input of nitrous oxide and groundwater. Well, I think the, the Lynx projects have been a great example of the value of collaborative research involving students, postdocs, and, and PIs at all stages of their career. I think one thing that, that helped in this regard was that we spent a lot of time early in the research defining responsibilities and policies for publication of the results. 